All right, this morning we are here to talk about guppies. Uh, you probably know them. That's an endler in the top left, which is related to a guppy, not a guppy, discovered by another person. Today what we're going to talk about is the man who first discovered, at least for the Western world, I'm sure the indigenous people of Venezuela and Trinidad and Antigua and Barbados all knew uh, that there was a fish that took over streams like none other. Uh, they called it Millions Fish uh, locally. We don't know the exact translation for that, um, but something along the lines of fish that makes millions of fish was the local name. Now, none of that seems to matter because we call it a guppy today. All throughout Europe and uh, the Asian market and the American market, we call them guppies. So the man responsible for the guppy, who probably looks something like, uh, let's see if we can get this to focus. He probably looks something like this guy. Uh, Mm, never mind the corn and whatever's going on there. But his name was John Robert Leshemir Guppy. Robert John Leshemir Guppy. Uh, the first two names are written interchangeably at different sources. Uh, usually he went by Robert. Um, but in any case, Robert John Leshemir Guppy was an interesting guy. He was born into semi-royalty who lived in a castle in France. And in France, his family expected him. Uh, he was raised by his grandparents. And they expected him to take over care of this castle. Um, they also were part of a London ar aristocracy. Um, and outside of London, the Kinnersley Castle... Um, was another one that he could have grown up to run and be in charge of. So this guy had royalty written all over him, um, at least for the time during the Industrial Revolution when a lot of people were struggling. So he has an interesting life. He became a civil engineer, which has nothing to do with his true passion of being a naturalist, but he became a civil engineer, and later he moved from... Uh, the Norman coast in France, after being born first in London, uh, he moved to the Norman coast of France, lived in a castle, then he lived in an English castle, this guy's got castles in his life, and then he decided, you know what, I'm sick of this boring, rich life, and I'm going to go travel the world. So, he hops on a boat, goes to Australia, goes to Tasmania, he's uh, looking at species and uh, starting to really get interested in paleontology as well. Paleontology, to day he dies, is what he claims he is interested in. Um, but in any case, he moves on and he ends up in New Zealand. <clears throat> he shipwrecks in New Zealand, to be precise, and he becomes a cartographer. He maps where his ship had wrecked, and this is all in the mid-1800s. And he's taken in by a group of local New Zealand Maori tribesmen and learns about them, kind of becomes an anthropologist before anthropology was uh, a real official science or study. And he's very interested by these people and still looking at, you know, fish and birds and fossils and anything he can get his hands on that, that's mildly uh, in the naturalist realm. And after this, uh, for some time, he comes across a British expedition and a Dutch expedition that are uh, together in a time of peace between uh, when there was constant wars over trading routes in the South Pacific. But he hops on another boat and he hears that his parents have become um, basically barons, plantation barons in Trinidad. They've taken their money and they've gone there. So he ends up heading there in his young 20 years, uh, twenty some years old and falls in love with naming fish and insects and birds. He still claims to be a paleontologist, but a lot of the papers that he wrote, if you go back and look at them, uh, are later discredited. I mean, they basically just picked up bones and they'd like assemble uh, you know, oh, here's a dragon, because I found a bone of this big long bone and this, these teeth. I found some shark teeth on the beach, so they must have lived in the same area and been the same thing. Uh, that was pretty common at the time. Uh, the Tyrannosaurus rex, for instance, was not the right animal for a really long time at the British Museum. It had too short of arms, it had uh, some t also some femur issues, so there's lots of stories full of that.
But in any case, he comes across these fish, and he goes to the Orinoco Delta, which is off the Venezuelan coast. Uh, there's salt water and fresh water mixing, and these little fish have made it all the way out to Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. So he starts studying them, and he finds out that guppies can withstand 150% salinity uh, above seawater, which is crazy. So they can live in not just seawater, but like tide pools that have evaporated in the heat. And uh, that's what makes them great for, you can put them in a saltwater tank if you acclimate, uh, acclimate them correctly. Uh, they can also live in a fully freshwater tank, and they're found all the way a thousand miles inland as well, uh, in in Venezuela and uh, on the uh, Brazilian border and in Guiana as well. So, just a little interesting bit of colonialism that we still call them guppies today. Uh, named after uh, Robert John Leshemir Guppy. Uh, many later came on to, uh, you know, specifically name subspecies and the endler and, and uh, different types. But the Pocelia reticulata, as we know it, uh, is named by Guppy. So he brings this fish back, sends it back to Europe, and people start putting it in their ponds to kill mosquitoes because it... it, it uh, multiplies so quickly, and they think, hey, that's kind of neat, you know, we can, we can, uh, kill a bunch of mosquitoes real quick, as you can see my tank, I have a bunch of babies, um, they just kind of they manifest, if you've got a male and a female, it's inevitable, so, uh, they get these fish, they put them in their ponds in the summer, and they take down mosquitoes by the boatload, they also take down algae and other, um, blooms of, uh, you know, um, eukaryotic little uh, critters and um, prokaryotic little critters in ponds and things. Uh, basically pond scum, they'll eat that when they're desperate. They like, you know, fresh food and larvae better and worms and stuff like that. But they'll do that. They'll, they'll even eat their young, you know, if you've kept them. So they get brought back and they get split up amongst royalty and scientists all over Europe and a few in the United States and they're kept in these uh, ponds and aquariums which are really just boxes and bowls and cups they didn't quite understand things but they were one of the first fish uh, also with carp that were able to be kept very easily um, in a bowl without a heater without um, you know, filtration, because they could live in that brackish, uh, murky water, and now, since that point, we have bred them, and it goes back to these rich colonialists, uh, you know, that had time on their hands, that were taking everything from tulips and flowers, and, um, breeding beautiful colors in those, to breeding fish, and, um, you know, his family had moved to Trinidad to escape, uh, part of the French Revolution um, kind of fallout, which was a, a turn all across Europe against the wealthy. And it's kind of a, a double-edged sword in that we have a rich colonialist, um, definitely a white supremacist, um, you know, not first and foremost, but just by nature of the times, who has brought us these awesome little fish, and now, you know, everyone can keep them, and they are the most widespread aquatic um, aquarium fish uh, that has made home in Florida, in San Diego, in, um, you know, uh, the Mediterranean region, in Africa, in several areas, all over Asia, in the Philippines, in Australia. And uh, it's all thanks to a rich arist aristocratic guy, uh, Mr. Guppy, that has passed it on. We have awesome strains like, you know, Berlin Buttercup and German, Ran uh, German Blues and uh, Moscow Blues and uh, you know, French uh, Long Tails and Sword Tails and classifications. And so... I'm not quite an expert on all that. I will brush up on it and talk to you about it in the future. But in the meantime, I just wanted to kind of give you a background about how colonialism played into your fish tank. So 
uh, it all stems back to that, and here we are today with this seemingly simple and common fish where at one point it was uh, only for nobility, and and this beautiful fish, there were, there were glimmers of, come on, focus, this beautiful fish that I can't get in focus, there were glimmers of its beauty, but nobody had uh, specifically bred them. It was kind of a one in a million shot out of ponds that they started to realize that, wow, these things are pretty awesome. And they take care of uh, mosquitoes, but later on they managed to escape in any place with water over about 65 degrees year round, they kind of wreaked havoc. So don't throw your guppies down the drain if you live in a warm area. Don't do it if you live in a cold area, it'll kill them. But that's kind of some of the backstory of how guppies made it from the Venezuelan rainforest and river systems to your bowl uh, in Singapore, in Tokyo, in Russia, in, you know, Paris, in C Seattle here. So just a little bit of history. Sorry that I don't have the production value that a lot of channels have, but I do have the uh, educational value, and we'll work on the production value in a bit. I'm kind of just testing this out to see if anybody is as much of a fish nerd as me. Um, wanted to tie in history with the tank. We'll go into politics and uh, how the impact of these naturalists coming and categorizing everything they can get their hands on had a role later. But for now, that's the story kind of backing up guppies. And uh, this is Alex Williamson, and we're looking at the history of the world through the eyes of a fish tank. We'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.